Hi, everyone. I'm Doug DeVos, and welcome back to Believe. If you're new to the show, you can find more episodes on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. My guest today is Blake Masters. I had a great conversation with him recently. He's a longtime Silicon Valley entrepreneur and U.S. Senate candidate from Arizona. We're going to talk about big tech. Are we using it right? Are we building it wrong? Is big tech our future? Well, these questions are out there and they'll affect us all. So now let's see what Blake Masters believes. We believe and have always believed in this country that man was created in the image of God, that he was given talents and responsibilities and was instructed to use them to make this world a better place in which to live. And you see, this is the really great thing of America. It's time to discover what binds us together and finding it has the power to transform our world. That's what I believe. How about you? So I, I'm tremendously honored to have uh, Blake Masters with us today. Blake, uh, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Blake knows tech uh, inside and out. Uh, Blake has uh, been with in Silicon Valley for a long time, worked alongside uh, a legendary entrepreneur uh, Peter Thiel. Uh, Blake is, uh, you know, he's well familiar with the principles around this, and Blake has uh, a, a lot going on. Blake's running for the U.S. Senate in the state of Arizona. Uh, so, Blake, before we start, I, I have to ask you about that. Just, you know, public service, just, and from a public service aspect, this is, it's hard. Being in public service today is hard, and, and then to, uh, uh, you know, to pursue something like that, I, I have a lot of admiration for you and, and for so many others who do it, because it's, it's tough to watch. So maybe tell us a little bit about why you're, why you're doing that. Well, thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me. Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, I get this question a lot. A lot of people want to say, Blake, what are you doing? Like, you work with Peter Thiel, you know, you get to invest in all these cool technology companies. Why on earth would you give that up to go run for office? And uh, fair enough, it's a good question. Maybe there's a little something crazy about it. But I actually think that uh, running for office and winning this Senate seat in Arizona right now is the most important thing I could be doing. You know, I look around at what's happening to the country and um, I think it's unacceptable, quite frankly. And, you know, one, we'll talk a lot about big tech today. One reason I want to get in there is because I know with my experience, uh, I'm one of the few people who could actually write an advanced legislation that would meaningfully restrain some of these big tech companies from some of their worst offenses. I don't think that's going to happen by default. I don't think it's going to happen by accident. So I think you need a new generation of actually younger, uh, more competent leadership to get in there and get some of this stuff done. So that's what I'm going to do. What's the worst case, right? I think I'm going to win. But if I didn't, I can go back to my comfortable life, making money, having fun, uh, working with Peter Thiel. But right now, this just feels important. I feel called to to do it. Well, that's that's great, and and I really appreciate that. You know, my brother uh, ran for governor of the state of Michigan years ago, and the same thing. He felt called to do it, yep. and and so I'm really proud of you and uh, your willingness to take that risk to step out there and uh, and to serve uh, uh, others uh, in that way. So uh, we pre we appreciate it. So thanks for what you're Thank doing, you. Blake. We're gonna we're gonna have some fun today talking about you know technology and and what it you know you know the 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 impact that it has in our life. But I, we want to hear from you. Tell us, give us your perspective about, uh, about not just technology, but big tech, this idea of these, these huge companies that have had such an influence. Is that our future? Is, is that what we as a society or individuals need to be, be prepared for? And if so, what's that future look like? Well, unfortunately, I think big tech is going to be a big part of the future. Um, it's precisely why we need to get in and get serious about helping shape that, because I think if we just let it happen, right, which is kind of our attitude right now towards big tech laissez faire, um, then I think it's an uglier future, just kind of like many aspects of the big tech present, I think are pretty ugly. Um, now I'm pro technology. You said this in your introduction, like everybody is enamored with the, the possibility and promise of technology, right? I think technology actually just means being able to do more with less right? More output with less resources. That is technology. Um, and so we, we do need better technology in almost every aspect of our lives. The problem is, I think in the last 30 or 40 years, we've had this narrow cone of progress, technolo technological development, uh, only in this sort of narrow band of IT, you know? And so, yeah, your smartphone gets better. Now you have 
uh, all these social media companies. But that's not really progress. I actually think in a lot of ways that helps us live worse lives, not better lives. Um, and so we'll talk about all the giant network monopolies, but the, the, point, the key point is, I think they're here to stay. And so it's, it's not like an upstart rival is just going to displace Facebook in two years. Facebook is here. It's powerful. I think in many ways it's a problem and we got to, we got to address that. You, you know, I had a, a, an interesting conversation with another uh, technology executive and talked about the promise of technology, uh, you know, when it started really from, you know, uh, applying the principles of empowerment. And I remember early in the, in, in the stages of, you know, e-commerce with the, with the Amway business, uh, I remember my father and Jay and Anna going, wow, if we, you know, if we would have had these tools when we were, you know, direct sellers, yeah. Think of what we could have done, but but somehow that promise seems to be elusive to find. But I have to you know recognize and acknowledge. Look at what technology is providing us to do right now. Have this conversation. Have a bit of a voice. So there are some good things happening. But how do we stay focused on the good and avoid uh, uh, and avoid the the things that uh, maybe aren't as good? Well, I think you know. I mean, this is neat. It's it's good to be able to video chat with you. You know, you're in Michigan, right? Okay. I'm, I'm over here in Arizona, right? Uh, sure, that's neat, right? I mean, but but there's all these other ways to cut this stuff. Like, you know, how how many times a day do you rely on your GPS app on your phone? I mean, I use that all the time, right? And I can feel my spatial awareness, right? Whatever module in my brain is responsible for telling me where I am in the world, that thing just shrinks, right? Because we're so reliant on this stuff. I, I, I think, you know, go back and read letters that the founding fathers wrote to each other you know, or that Carlisle wrote to, you know, Emerson or something. And that's what's possible when people aren't always looking at a phone or thinking in sort of 140 characters or TikTok sound bites. So yeah, some of this stuff is good. Some of it's neutral and it's just the way it is. But a lot of it, I think, has a very dark underbelly. Um, but how do we focus on the good and, and sort of excise the bad? I think you just look at the biggest abuses and you start from there. So conservatives, certainly the ones I'm talking to in my political race, um, they're upset about censorship. And I totally understand why. Uh, whatever you think of President Trump, you have to agree. It's crazy that he was ripped off of Facebook and Twitter while he was still president. I think that's just really crazy. I don't think that should be allowed. I don't think that these big tech companies should be able to censor uh, based on political speech. And so that's an issue, right? I think um, even sort of in a politically neutral context, look at addiction, right? People are addicted to their smartphones. It's a problem that not enough people talk about. And Facebook and Twitter, you know, they employ psychologists right next to the software engineers to try to make these products, make these algorithms as addicting as possible. And so I think that's a problem. Maybe they shouldn't be allowed to do that. You know, devil's in the details. We got to go and figure out what's going on and what to do about it. But high level, I do think we can identify some very discrete abuses that these companies are perpetrating and just zoom in on those. Right. I'm not trying to say you can't have Facebook. I'm trying to say Facebook should not be allowed legally to serve targeted advertising to people it knows are under 18 years old. Well, and you have, you know, you have young children and, you know, the idea of, you know, technology in one space, but social media yeah. is, seems like another application of it in a whole different way. You know, you, you know, technology to, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, in, in the healthcare field, yes. you know, what they're doing today, how they're using technology to create better health outcomes. And, and as I'm involved with local hospitals and, and just to see how many advances that they can, you know, that they can take in a sh relatively short period of time, considering the scope of history. But social media seems to be a different take on it. And so maybe help us understand that distinction a little bit. Well, I think there's something really unhealthy about social media. You know, the, the promise of the internet in general was that it was going to be liberating. It was going to be individualistic, right? Everybody was going to get to, to speak their mind. And we saw that, I think, in the early web. And then I think because of just this hidden power of the uh, targeted advertising business model, what you saw were the, the emergence of these giant networked monopolies. You know, Facebook is a monopoly. Twitter is a monopoly. And um, Google, you know, slightly different context, less social, more search. But Google has a monopoly. And these companies are so entrenched and so powerful 
uh, you, you basically can't hope to compete with them. Um, you know, anytime someone does, you know, the line is always, if you don't like it, just go build your own Twitter, go build your own Facebook. Well, a company called Parler tried to do that. And because they didn't own the whole stack in the internet infrastructure, right? They were beholden to Amazon Web Services and Apple, you know, to just let them on the, the app store. Um, they got shut down, you know, and there was some political pretext for why that was appropriate, but actually it was just crushing an upstart rival. So these companies are very powerful. And then, yeah, I actually think social media isn't so great. Like, I think it's actually really bad for people to, to focus on the screen. And, um, you know, the, the Facebook is trying to tell us with the metaverse that we're all just going to be jacked into virtual reality headsets for hours a day. And I think that's such a cope. You know, we live in the real world. We should be using technology, as you said, in the healthcare sector, right? Other sectors to make our real lives better. And we shouldn't be using it as an escape from those real lives. And I think that's where it gets really dark and ugly. Most people spend over an hour a day on social media, you know, and scrolling through that endless feed. I think it's actually really bad for people psychologically. That does not mean we should ban it, but it does mean we should have a government, I think, that's tracking the problem and serious about making sure that it doesn't get out of hand. And I think it's at least starting to get there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let, let's take a different track. Let's go to your, your your experience a little bit more. You've you've been in Silicon Valley. You've been part of this. You know, one of the aspects of, of the technology companies is this incredible, at least at some point in our history, unbelievable entrepreneurial space. Just this explosion of ideas and creativity, and and look at the impact it's had. It's you know, you know technology is now. 12% of our GDP, right? It, it's just, and it's growing fast. It's this huge, huge element. But somewhere, you know, somewhere in there, can you give us an insight in Silicon Valley about the culture? Because you know, the, the culture always will, you know, can take something and it can shift it a little bit to being positive or it can shift it a little bit to being negative. So as, as our listeners are kind of going through this, you, you know, help us understand or give us some insights as to the culture behind some of the, the work that's being done at these companies uh, and, and what we need to know or, or what we should know as we kind of form our own beliefs. Yeah, it's interesting. The culture, I think, changes so much depending on the size and the scale of the company, you know, and, and uh, you know, San Francisco, Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, these, these cultures, the wider sort of Silicon Valley tech cultures, they're also not what they used to be. Unfortunately, they're deteriorating. I think a lot of uh, talent is, is leaving Silicon Valley. Things are becoming much more decentralized. But with those caveats, if you think about like classic Silicon Valley culture, maybe circa 2013, uh, 2014, it was just very dynamic. And, you know, this this was before I think Facebook and Google were around, they were ascendant, but they weren't yet sort of super, super dominant and that you couldn't possibly do something adjacent to their businesses. And so you had all these small companies, people, you know, a dozen people working together, maybe a hundred people once the company got to a series B level. Um, and And each company has its own unique culture, you know, and I think in a healthy startup, the the mission, of the company becomes the company culture. You know, it's very different from like a bank or an insurance brokerage or something where you're, you're doing your thing and that's a well-known understood process. And then you try to have sort of best HR practices, a good company culture and in a, in a healthy dynamic startup that's actually building new technology. I've seen how the culture is actually the mission. You know, you wanna look at like Elon Musk and SpaceX. The culture at SpaceX was when he founded it and it always has been we got to build the best rockets for cheaper that was it that's what people are obsessed with and i think when you get really smart talented people together and they're all excited about changing the world is the cliche way to put it but actually just building something that allows humans to do something they couldn't do before that's technology that's carry that's got a charisma of its own and that's when you get these really good cultures unfortunately and i think facebook used to have that to be clear, I think it was probably very exciting to work at Facebook 2004 or 2010. But once you become a giant networked monopoly, right? Twitter's the, the best example of this. Twitter's incredibly mismanaged. It's horribly run. The culture is horrible. Um, but once they have that monopoly where they get to be Twitter and no one else does and no one can hope to compete with it and all the journalists are on it and you know politicians are on it, that's frozen. They have their monopoly profit stream 
And then I think the culture really suffers. That's where I think it gets very vulnerable to being uh, infected by whatever you want to call it, wokeism or social justice, where, where you get these, these huge cadres in the company that are obsessed with politics, obsessed with social issues. This is not what tech companies should be focused on, right? They should be focused on innovating, making new tech. But once these companies become huge, giant administrative bureaucracies, I think they lose the culture and they become stagnant. And you see that in the products that they build. Yeah, fa fascinating. And, and how, you know, culture is so elusive. And, and once you lose yeah. it, you know, okay. getting it back and, and bringing it back. You, you, you wrote something in, 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 in talked about the idea and you're, you're in this space of innovation. Help us understand how, uh, you know, how that culture has shifted in the entrepreneurial space. Because you've written and talked about the fact that, that you know, the, the startups today aren't looking to change the world. They're just looking to get to a size so they can sell to Facebook or they can sell to some of the other big tech. Yeah. Help us understand what that means and what that what impact that has on our uh, on our innovation, our ability to innovate and our ability to to keep moving forward in this space. Yep. Well, if you imagine a spectrum and on one end is Elon Musk, you know, who's just he was not trying to sell a company. He wasn't trying to make money after he sold PayPal. You know, he made a lot of money. I think he made 50 million or 100 million dollars. He could have just retired, right? He put all that money back into his new companies, Tesla and SpaceX. He risked it all. Like I've never seen anybody in the whole world with a, a risk tolerance, with an appetite for risk like Elon. And so, okay, maybe you can't actually do that, but people should directionally be more like that on the spectrum. But the other side of the spectrum, you've got, you know, a, a a founder with a very consultant like mindset and can i just build some humble product or service that could never be a standalone business right you could never imagine it going public someday um but you're doing it just because you've identified some niche in you know some giant corporate environment the oracle or facebook or something and you think you can build something you know not to stand on its own but just to fold in just to sell to these companies and um, maybe that's still good in some sense, you know, good for you if you can get it to work. In theory, everybody wins. But the danger is if most tech entrepreneurs start gravitating too much to that side of the spectrum. And I'm seeing that most people, young people, they know if they can just build something that could credibly threaten to compete with Facebook someday. Facebook will just buy it. And they'll often buy it in its infancy for five or 10 million bucks. And okay, that's good for the founders. And if you're a 20 something founder, you've just made a little bit of money. But what would that founder have done with that company without Facebook, right? The world was sort of deprived, I think, of a, of a realistic shot at getting some new product. And I've just seen too much of the culture. It's too, too little Elon and too more, how do I sell to Zuckerberg, right? That's not what Zuckerberg was thinking when he built Facebook. In fact, he turned down a one billion offer, one billion dollars from Yahoo. And I think his quote at the time was that someone said, like, Mark, because Facebook probably wasn't worth a billion dollars at the time, you know, and, and they're like, why did you turn down that enormous amount of money? And he said, well, I like running Facebook and I have big plans for it. And yeah, it's a lot of money, but I'm not sure what I would do with the money. I'd probably just want to go start Facebook again. You know, and I think this was 2005 or six or whatever. And that was a, a healthy attitude that people who are building the future that are building technology should have. Um, and of course, I think Facebook, you know, became too big and too powerful and went down a, a lot of wrong paths. But that early entrepreneurial mindset was why it was able to, to also be so big. And now I just think we have a lowering of ambition. This isn't unique to tech. I think this is endemic in our society, but we just lower uh, the bar for individual ambition. People start to think they have less agency. Certainly I couldn't be Elon Musk, so I wouldn't even try. And then you just end up doing something that's more formulaic and boring. That's a powerful thought and a scary thought that we're losing. It's really kind of saying we're losing our edge, yeah. you know, and, and the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, we, you know, in, in, uh, in the Amway history, my, my father and Jay had an experience that we talk about often where somebody wanted to buy them and they said, no, we want to have our own business. Yeah. They said, well, if you don't sell, we'll just compete with you. You know, we're pretty good. We can make those products. We can do this stuff, you know, and they're like, no, <laughs> you yeah. know, hey, we, you know, we, 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 we started a business because we wanted a business and, and 
and to see, you know, in, in your experience, uh, if that's going away, that's really scary. But you're in the middle of also creating through the through this through this fellowship. You cre- you're creating entrepreneurs. You're investing. You're staying close to. Uh, and, and so, how are you keeping that entrepreneurial spirit? alive how are how are you and what are you seeing in there are, are, are you seeing enough of those people who just want to have their own business and and are absolutely committed to uh, uh, to keep moving forward well I'd like to see more certainly like to see more yeah. and okay trend is somewhat yeah. alarming but it but uh, it is heartening to to see that there still are so many actually and and young people um, especially so we started the teal fellowship program in 2011. And so it's been running for about 10 years. I think there's something like 200, 240 fellows. And this is one of my favorite things that I've done professionally is just sort of, you know, be involved and help shepherd this program. We paid. That's fantastic. 204, 240 fellows yeah, that you've we been pay, doing. That's fantastic. We, we paid all of them $100,000 to drop out of college or stop. Out. Wow. It's like 10% of the kids go back. But if they go back, they go back to school with renewed clarity and focus. Like this time, they actually know why they're going. Um, but 90% don't go back. And, and some of those, you know, some start companies and, and you know, they're modest successes or the companies don't work and people go start something else or get a job. But some have been fantastically successful. And it's these young kids who are just basically accepting the offer that we provide. We don't do the work. They build their companies. We just sort of we're out there and we're saying, hi, it's OK if you're really smart and talented. It's OK not to go to college. In fact, you'd be better served trying to actually build something, right? Develop your skills, build a product, go sell it, see what you can learn, see what you can figure out. That's a much better education for a whole lot of people uh, than going to a modern university today, you know, and sitting in a classroom for five, six hours a day, just listening to what some professor tells you. Um, the university education system is not all that it used to be. And I think there's tremendous opportunity for young people who just want to build something. And so that's, that's what the fellowship exists to do, not just to help the 20, 25 kids that get it every year, but also to be a beacon and to show people that, uh, you should at least ask the question before going to college is, does this make sense for me or would I be better served and better serve, you know, my fellow man by getting out there and building something? What what a great you know, idea. What a what a great theory to go through and, and engage people and give them the opportunity, because you know, if you have that thought and somebody doesn't come alongside you, you know, it's hard to move forward. Yeah. But this idea of using technology or using, you know, in this case, investment as empowering for those folks, and and where so many times in in, in tech. We, we're, we're missing that. So t- let me ask you, let me shift just a little bit here. Talk about, you know, uh, you know, the perspective of big technology from us as users. You know, how do we, or consumers, how do we think about consuming? As you say, you know, anything could be addictive. If you want to have a glass of wine, that's great. But if it becomes addictive, if you, you know, you know anything that you kind of do in life, you know, in moderation seems to be generally okay. But in this space, it seems we need a little education, especially for those of us who might be a little older, <laughs> who are who are not native to the use of technology. How do we think about it? And how do we, you know, in your situation with young children, think about creating an environment where, as a consumer of technology, we're a little smarter about it and, and, find, and, and we search for the good side and avoid the bad stuff? Yep. No, it's a great question. It's um, it's tough because the real answer is that people need to be disciplined, like self-discipline. It, like we know what it looks like, right? It looks like keeping everything in moderation and doing what you know is good for you, what you know is healthy. Um, people know that sitting on their smartphones for hours on end, just like, you know, being addicted to Netflix or, you know, bad food or sort of lack of exercise. Like we know that's bad for us. But the default is the path of least resistance. And so people do it. I mean, self-discipline is a real problem. I think in big tech context, it's compounded because it's actually a little bit less clear that this stuff is bad for us. I think we know it intellectually, but in the moment, what this stuff does is it really does hack our psychology. You know, you, you see, I mean, the algorithms are so good 
at knowing what you like, what you're likely to like based on content that you've consumed, you know, for the last year or however long you've been on the platforms, these things just get better and better. And I think that starts to look predatory. You know, uh, we give so much information as consumers to Google, to Facebook, to Apple, if you have an iPhone, these companies build a profile of everywhere you've been. They know when you go to the dry cleaners, they know, oh, you, this ad, you watched the whole ad versus only five seconds of that ad. And they've got smart machine learning algorithms to make inferences about your preferences based on your consumption patterns. And so when you see something in your feed, I think it's easy for most people to just say, oh, well, this is my feed. This is just, you know, it's like reading the newspaper. It's right there. People don't quite realize how hyper targeted that feed is to you. It's designed to make you spend more time on the platforms and it's designed to make you click on ads that will make those companies money. And I think people know this again, but they know it. It's some high level intellectual thing. Um, they don't really know how the sausage gets made, which is what I've seen. They don't really know how vulnerable everybody, myself included, right? I'm biased to say this advertising stuff doesn't work on me. No, it works on everybody. That's the point. It can short circuit our, psych our psychology. And so I, I really worry about it. I mean, I think Apple doing the screen time reminders, you know, you can set reminders to say, hey, you've been on this app for 30 minutes and you can even shut the app down. I think that's like a pretty good tool to give to people, but it requires self-discipline. You can just hit ignore. And I think a lot of people do that. The biggest thing that we can do here is look out for our children. And I will tell you, most of the CEOs and software designers that I know in Silicon Valley, they do not let their kids play with screens. They don't give their kids devices, whether their kids are two years old or 12 years old. These people know what their products are doing and they give their, like me, I don't give my kids an iPhone. You know, my kids are seven, five and two. We, we give the boys wooden blocks, you know, carved from Amish country or whatever, and we let them play in the mud outside. We try to give them a real childhood because uh, we know how destructive these screens can be. So it's a hard problem to solve, but I think it starts by being hyper aware that it's I think, much worse than people think. And I'll, I'll bet your kids love those wooden blocks. Oh, love and I'll bet they love being in the mud. Yeah, they make cardboard forts. I mean, this is what kids should be doing, not just looking at an iPhone. But you go to a family restaurant and you look around and you see families and they should be having a dinner table conversation, but they're not because every kid is just glued to a phone, right? All right. And that's really bad. Yeah, like exactly. that's really, really yeah. bad. Yeah, exactly. We, you, you know, I, you know, there's this idea of being out. And I don't know. I hate to say the good old days, yeah. right? But you know, the good old days before that, yeah, you, you know, you didn't have anything. Parents just said, "Go outside," and when it gets dark, come yeah, home. Yeah, figure it out. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, figure out what. Yeah, figure out what you got to do. You know, take care of yourself. You know, climb a tree, do something. Yeah. And if you hurt yourself really bad, we'll hear you yell. I guess. Yeah. You know, we'll go from there. So the, the, we talked about self-discipline on the user side, but for these big companies, to a certain extent, these, these are smart people. And, and they know if they overstep or maybe if they go too far, they'll, they may hurt their market. It, is there a, a calculation that's being made that, uh, that, they can, that, they, that this can be done and it's going to be okay? Or is it a, like you said, so Apple creates a tool to at least give you you know, a, a, an option to uh, to discipline yourself. Are, are big tech companies going to be serious about pursuing that and be serious about uh, limiting themselves for how far they might reach or is the culture too far gone? Well, I do agree that they're, they're, they're smart people. And, you know, I know these questions are on their radar. I think you're right, though. I think they make the calculation that it's fine. Like it's good for the the business model, both to pursue all these things that I think are predatory or exploitative. It's also good for the business model to have some good PR around all the things that you're doing to, you know, curb the abuses. So Facebook gets out and says, you know, here's our teen mental health initiative. And they're trying to undo some of the damage that they've done. And I think a lot of that is a PR stunt. Some of it may be sincere, but the point is they're actively doing damage every day. And so if you roll out a program that's trying to mitigate some of that, like fine, but it, it's actually, they're not going to go as far as they need to. And I also think these companies are emboldened because they know 
that as it's currently constituted, uh, Congress has no chance, no prayer of meaningfully restraining these companies, right? Like you've seen the tech hearings and um, what an opportunity it is to get Mark Zuckerberg in the hot seat. You get to grill him. There's a lot of questions that I would love to ask him in a Senate hearing, but some of these senators, you know, and I know many of them, um, some of them, you know, God bless them, some of the nicest people you'll meet, but they're like 75 or 80 years old. Yeah. And they get Mark Zuckerberg in the hot seat and it's just, they don't even know the basic vocabulary, right? And Mark Zuckerberg is smart. Like I disagree with him on so many things, but he is a smart person and he will just evade you and, and walk circles around you. I mean, the man built Facebook and you get, you know, these senators that are talking about the internet in ways that, that make any person under the age of 40 absolutely keel over with laughter, right? And Wall Street sees this. And so after the, the hearings, Facebook stock price goes up and, you know, Zuckerberg is, he's up there saying, regulate me, like, bring it on, please help me. Please regulate me. I mean, he knows that these people don't have a chance. Uh, and so I think the companies know, yeah, ultimately the market decides, but if the market is hundreds of millions of people who are basically addicted to your monopoly product, I think that's a, a pretty inefficient market. And so I think the companies know that for the time being, they can basically get away with whatever they want. You said that. Elaborate on that a little bit for the time being. You, 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 know, uh, you know, are we going to learn as a society or as, as consumers? Or are we going to learn is this just irregardless of government interaction or, or, or intervention or anything like that? Yeah, you know, over time, generally people learn. Can we learn before it's too late? I think that's an open question here. I'm optimistic, but I'm only optimistic because I think the government has a role to play here. And I think we're going to get politicians like myself in office. Others uh, will join me and help. And I think it's I think it's going to take that. I don't think consumers will just decide, you know, not to like Facebook or OK, there's a good version of this already happening. Right. People are peeling off of Facebook classics product. That product is aging. Young people, 20 year olds, they don't use Facebook classic, but they do use Instagram and they do use WhatsApp, you know, also properties owned by Facebook or Meta is the, the Meta company now. And uh, Facebook can just buy anything new that's taking hold. And I think that's a problem. Keep finding the, the, the next, products, keep like finding Facebook, the next one. Yeah, but the corporate power behind this, right? And, and Facebook is pretty good at integrating all of this data. They get data from people from WhatsApp, from Instagram, from Facebook Classic, because it's the same corporation. They roll it all up, manipulate it, and then turn it around to do what they do, which is serve targeted advertising in hyper-efficient ways. So I think they'll find a new front end to addict people, right? To serve the youth that's always looking for the next thing. That's not the social media app that their parents are on. But I don't think this is a happy tale of, oh, in 10 years, people will just get tired of this and innovation will happen and Facebook won't be a thing. I think these network monopolies are probably going to be here with us for a lot longer than we'd want to admit. But like one of the things that we go back, you, you touched on earlier, but you, you talked about the, the ability to turn on the machine so people have a voice or can participate in technology, primarily social platforms or turn it off with regard to censorship. I, I, I'm engaged with the National Constitution Center in, in Philadelphia and free speech you know, is not only an element of the First Amendment, but it just, it's so central to, to freedom. Um, and how, do we, how should we be thinking about this, this concept of the ability, our, our, our founders, the framers of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, this idea to speak your mind, that you have a right to speak your mind. Uh, and then now we seem to be in an era where the public square tends to be these platforms, mm -hmm. but somebody else makes a decision of whether you can speak your mind or not. How, how should we be thinking about free speech in this in this environment yeah i think it's a huge problem i think these big tech companies and the platforms they offer have become the new town squares like that you know doesn't mean you need to nationalize them and seize them as public utilities exactly right. but it means right. it's a new ball game this is a new ball game and you can't just say oh well facebook's a private company well first of all no it's not right because in some key sense it's like working closely with, say, this current Biden White House 
uh, White House communications office flags certain posts about vaccines or whatever, and they request that Facebook removes those because they're misinformation. And Facebook is happy to comply, right? Because they want a good relationship with the government. And that right there, that's a fusion of corporate and state power that makes me very uncomfortable. It should make all sort of civil libertarians uncomfortable. Uh, but even if you wanted to say Facebook is a private company, okay, fine. It's also more powerful than most governments. It's absolutely huge, it's genuinely multinational. And I think we can afford, because it's got you know a billion people on the platform or whatever, uh, to treat it differently than a local bakery or a local hair salon. And I think we have to. So the easiest fix here for the you know First Amendment free speech uh, stuff is to simply treat these companies as common carriers, right? We already know how to do this. This is how we treat the phone company. This is how we treat a train or an airline. And these companies, um, they can be private. They can you know make returns, quasi private anyway. They can make returns for their shareholders, but they're not allowed to discriminate against their customers based on the content of their speech, right? Uh, the phone company can't kick you or I off because they're listening in and we're having a political conversation. So I have no idea why we would treat Facebook or Twitter to a different standard and be more permissive, especially when we see all this evidence that these companies are censoring people based on their political speech. So that's not an innovative solution. We already know how to do it. That just takes political will. But I think any kind, and you could draw the line somewhere that doesn't impact small businesses or startups trying to get off the ground, right? But once you have, I don't know, 50 million users in a communications utility or platform, we're going to regulate you like a common carrier. And you're not going to be able to discriminate against users based on the content of their political speech. Hard to get done, but you can know that it's actually a simple solution. And you can imagine in the next few years us being successful at getting that done. Yeah, it, it, fascinating to think through. There's the, the the will to really think about this differently. And what you're bringing up to me, what 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 I'm you know, hearing hearing from you is we have to think differently. That it that there may be some old models we can use, like you say, a common carrier model that we've applied to other things. But this is here to stay, yeah. and we're going to have to figure out how to. And what you're, what I'm hearing from you is you're talking about the different roles and responsibilities either the companies have, or the regulators have, or or consumers have, or the marketplace has, or the, you know innovators have uh, of how we play in this. And because this is so big, pers pervasive, uh, and, and impactful, it's really challenging us. Yep. Is that am I hearing that correctly? That's right. And you know we're only talking about what we understand well now, which is sort of like Facebook censorship and what about all the future developments you know what about uh facial recognition technology right as that becomes more and more ubiquitous every time you step outside your house your face is getting captured by government entities you know uh, also by private businesses where does that data go who owns it who can do what with it right um deep fakes you know this idea that uh, as as technology gets good enough video rendering and stuff uh, anybody can make a video of you or anybody else that looks 100% lifelike, realistic. They match vocal patterns. You know, I can make a video of a political opponent saying whatever I want them to say, and it would almost be indistinguishable from reality. I don't think people realize how much of a game changer that is, how much of a live electrical wire that is. Like if you could just see a video of somebody and not know if that was actually them or a simulation because the video is so good all bets are off there like it starts to look really weird especially in this current internet culture where you know you can get a, a mob a twitter mob ginned up and excited about any perceived you know impropriety and so, you know, I don't pretend to have the solutions about that, but these are the problems, you know, it's, we need to start to think about the problems that we're going to see in three, four, five years, because if we wait until they're just here on us, I think the regulatory response will be either inadequate or maybe overkill and ham handed, but you know, it's a brave new world out there with all this new technology. And so we need to think creatively and differently about how do we make this work for us? How do we help make sure that this helps humans and families to flourish instead of just destroy us maybe slowly or 
more dramatically. <laughs> the time frame that that tech works in, you know, so sometimes it's easy for me or my generation when you're a little older. So, you know, well, you know, next three to five, seven to ten years, you're talking about massive shifts in a short amount of time. Fast, yeah. you, you know, you know that 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 just we're not prepared to to think about and and that's what we're trying to do i think here with this discussion is help us to be prepared to think about these sorts of things so that we can you know get ahead a little bit so we're not reacting let let me do i, I got a couple more things and then then i'll let you go and we're you know, blake it's just been so fun and your insights into technology are just just wonderful so thank you you touched on you know civility or the mob you know that that jumps on and and again i'll go back to what i what i've learned with my work with the national constitution center that, that you know this was a huge fear that you would have big crowds that would gather and and i i, I remember when my you know my dad would yell at us you know as kids and say i'm going to read you the riot act yeah. i learned that that was a real that was a real thing right. there there was a real riot act that that's what would have to calm the mob this here's the laws concerning a mob but but on a social platform the mobs can get going and has devastating impact on an individual. That's right. You know, how, how, and what, how do you see that impacting our culture as a society? Well, I think it has a huge negative effect. I think it has a, a chilling effect, right, on free speech. If you've got a, an opinion that you suspect might be unpopular, you're not going to say it, right? You need to either be so independently wealthy and not beholden to anybody or you just need to have an enormous appetite for risk that most people don't have sensibly um, to actually speak your mind. And I, I think that's a problem. You know, it'd be one thing if these online mobs just stayed online, you know, if it's just about people saying mean things about you online, well, they've got a right to do that. You know, you've got a right to say what you think. They've got a right to say what they think. And if that gets ugly and insulting or whatever, I mean, I believe in tools to filter that stuff out. But I believe people should say whatever they want, as long as it's legal, literally, as long as it's not like immediately inciting violence. Uh, the problem is these online mobs, when they form, um, they don't stay online. There are very real world consequences for the, the people who get targeted, who get scapegoated. Um, it's very easy to direct that mob to call that person's employer and demand that they be fired. And very often the employers cave, um, even though maybe the target offense or alleged offense was, you know, just purely private in nature, had nothing to do with the employer, you know, maybe it was set at the employee's house. But the employer, you know, they have their own set of incentives and they want to get the PR crisis away. And so they fire the person, right? Or people actually get stalked and doxxed and harassed and people show up at their house and protest, right? I mean, true mob behavior. And once that gets going, once it goes too far, it's very hard to put that cat back in the bag. And so I really worry about the consequences of this online behavior. And again, I think it's so easy for these algorithms and viral videos to get people excited about stuff that they would have never seen before. You know, and there's another, the, the counterpoint is the transparency is really good, right? Now, all of a sudden, every police officer is wearing body cameras. Uh, I think in some ways that's really good, actually probably net protects the police officers too. Um, but when one viral video, especially when it could be clipped to not show the full context and therefore sometimes very misleading, when that can get out and boom, in the next one hour, millions of people have made up a judgment and they're targeting an individual. That can get really out of hand. We've seen some examples of that. And I think frankly, the worst examples are still yet to come. Um, so just a huge problem frankly. Yeah, we need to stay aware of it. Let me, I, we, we've had your time, Blake, this has just been such a, a, an enlightening and informative conversation. Let me kind of, we'll kind of wrap it here. You talked about, uh, on this, on this topic, you talked about kind of the, the linkage where, you know, where a political arm or the government talks to a social media company and says, hey, this is now misinformation, or they've made a decision that it's right or wrong. And, and then a company Responds, and you've talked about competition trying to find their way in, but going through the infrastructure of actually competing with a tech giant uh, today. There's so many bits and pieces that are controlled by other tech giants that that this idea uh, of speaking truth to power or being able to compete 
seems to be more elusive than we may want to believe That's right. uh, you know, as a society. Um, but it, 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 is that real? I mean, it's, it, it's a pretty scary thing. And, and, and if it is, then help us understand some of the things we could be thinking about or, or, or should be uh, you know, doing um, to restore the ideas of entrepreneurship, empowerment, you know, freedom, you know, I- I- individual character I- I- and you know, you know, civility uh, you know, I- in our dialogue. Hel- help us uh, understand. Maybe we can kind of close with that topic. It's a real simple one, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, the problem is as bad as you, as you say. Right. I mean, I think the government is very interested right now in in working with and controlling these big tech companies, I think, in a, in a bad way. Right. Like the Biden administration fusing with Facebook um, and so much of the Internet infrastructure is owned by the same ha- handful of companies that all kind of have the same politics and the same the same thoughts on this stuff. So that's dangerous. But I think um, there's two things I'd say. One, on the entrepreneur side of things, people really can build good things if they feel like they have individual agency and if they set out uh, to do something very ambitious. You know, Elon Musk at SpaceX, like he is the reason why we're able to take U.S. astronauts to the space station now, right? Because the space shuttle was decommissioned. Elon knew he could build a better rocket company. He did it by being vertically integrated and by not relying on the big defense contractor primes. Right. So he knew that he had to go outside the system. A really hard thing to do, but he got it done. Another example, a company that we invested in is Rumble. Rumble is kind of a online video platform. Best thought of as maybe a alternative to YouTube that's truly about free speech. And the way Rumble and the, the founder, Chris Pavlovsky, is really talented. Uh, they started in like 2013 and they own, you know, so much of their own infrastructure, like all the servers all the, you know, almost every nut and bolt, as much as you can own without, you know, building a sort of parallel internet. He works on the real internet, but like they own all their stuff and they built that company up that way so that they could be censorship resistant. And so things like that give me um, hope, but not every entrepreneur is Elon or Chris P. And so I do think we need a political solution here too. And this is why you know I'm running. This is why I'm excited to get in office, and we need new legislative solutions. Like we need to make sure. I don't want the government to regulate absolutely everything. Like I'm a pro free market guy, but I think the government's job is to set the conditions of fair play that then these companies can operate uh, freely within. And right now, it's just a little too laissez faire, and you get so much corporate concentration. Frankly, I think it's bad for consumers, and. Um, it's going to be a really interesting fight in the next five or 10 years, but I'm optimistic both on the legislative side and if we can encourage more individual founders to have high agency, high ambition uh, like Elon and, and Chris P. There are some good counterexamples to this worrying trend. Well, Blake, Blake Masters, uh, I, I, I thank you so much for your time. It's been a fascinating conversation. Blake, uh, you know, for our audience, his insight in, in the technology space, his work with uh, with Peter Thiel, but your work individually and, and your commitment to public service. You talk a lot about legislative, about the right, smart solutions and the role, the proper role of government. And so uh, uh, your willingness to... Uh, to, to put your neck out there and take risk but in search of uh, serving in public office uh, is, is admirable. So thank you for that. And, and thank you for enlightening all of us about these ideas of, of freedom and empowerment of individual agency and character and, and entrepreneurship and innovation. You know, these ideas and how they apply to this question uh, of big tech in our future yep. uh, and, and how we need to think about it. So, Blake, th- thank you so much for uh, taking uh, taking the time to be with us and love to check back in with you as time goes on to uh, keep this topic fresh, because as you said, it's not going away and it's moving fast. That's right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Great. Take care. Have a great day, Blake. Thanks for everybody. Uh, we'll wrap up this episode of Believe and uh, great uh, appreciation for Blake Masters. Thanks, everybody.